Hey, hey, Facebook. How's everybody doing? Hope you're having a fantastic Tuesday. Steve, you just got back in town, didn't you? Oh, yeah, and I'm glad to be warm. It's 99 degrees here, and it feels awesome. Yeah. I have been, I have been in Indianapolis, Indiana at an awesome expo called the Hoosier Expo. It's 40 years this expo has been going. There's not another expo out there that's come close to it. Anyway, it was snowing when I left there at about four o'clock in the morning, climbed on an airplane, had to be de-iced. I don't like the cold. Yeah, you don't have to shovel sunshine. No, no, just wipe a little dust off the windshield. That's all you got to do. Folks, my name's Dave Shrine. This is Steve Edwards. We are here again. I don't know how many weeks this marks, but it marks a good amount of time that we've been here every single week talking mules and donkeys and doing everything that we can to help you have a more rewarding relationship with your animal. And that's what this is all about. So today we're going to answer all your questions just like we've done weeks before and just like we'll do weeks in the future. We're going to answer as many questions as we can get to to make sure that you have what you need uh, to get that most relationship out of your animal. And I just want to remind you that um, this is a live first priority. So I have a list. I'll show you again. Last two weeks I showed you. I've got my list right here of about 15 questions. But the ones that get the priority are the ones that come in live. So if you have any questions, we want to see that comment section going. So share in the comment section where you are watching from today and what the weather is like. It is in the It is healthy 90 plus degrees out here in Arizona, of course, it's a little bit cooler on the ranch than it is in here in the uh, in the city part of the uh, of the state. But it's feeling pretty good. The warmth is not something that we frown upon out here. No, we got a little breeze blowing out here right now. Pretty nice. You you almost always have a breeze going on out there. I love being out there on the ranch. Yeah, we got it's the fresh air district. They say that the air and the water is better in this area here than almost any place in the valley. Yep, awesome. So we've got Kimberly Heyman Mitch is here watching. Eric Palmer chimed in watching. Gloria Meyer from Ohio uh, is watching. She says, it was good to see you at the Hoosier <coughs> Horse Fair. Enjoyed talking mules with you. That was That's great. I'm glad she was able to get out there. She was great. And I, hey, Mitch, Mitch just got him a new mule. If it's the same Mitch, got him a new mule. And while he was there, he bought all my saddles and tack. That's awesome. Is that the same Mitch? Uh, Kimberly Hammond Mitch. Last ah, name okay, Mitch. gotcha. But we like Mitch too. Hey, I I uh, I got a uh, a phone call. Well, I you know I call every one of my clients that that purchases things or and this sort of thing. So I call them all, and I called this one lady by the name of Jana, and uh, she she was so excited. She says we're we're in telegraphing together. I said, what do you mean? She said, I was just thinking about you. Thinking that, wow, how this works so well. She watched me at the Hoosier Expo and watched this mule who didn't want nothing to do with her owner and uh, watched me flop tarps all around and the mule standing perfectly still with the come along hitch on it. And she said she bought the come along rope. She went home and took it to her donkey. They've tried for several days to load that donkey in a trailer. <laughs> she said it took less than 15 minutes jumped the donkey right in and she goes wow let me try something else and she took her another colt and then she took a mule that seemed to be kind of stiff and she said steve it worked on all of them she told me she wants to make a video so folks can see how well that come along hitch worked that's awesome well we actually have yeah. a question here from kevin who was at um at the uh hoosier and he says, is there a video Steve could uh, show the button, the magic button to make the mule lift his feet? And so I do have that video, Kevin. It'll be a little bit hard to demonstrate here without the mule, but I've got videos. Do you want to say anything, Steve? No, that kind of blew people away. <laughs> I had this mule right there, and this mule had been a pain. This was another mule uh, besides the, the one that Connie brought me. And... Uh, this big old mule boy wouldn't stand still. This little girl that owned it, she couldn't weigh 90 pounds sopping wet, but she was tough. She shoots archery off of her mule. Wow. So anyway, they said, how do you pick up a front foot? I said, there's a button right here. And I went over and pushed it, and the, and the leg come up, and she goes, everybody went, wow, did you see that? You know? 
So that's awesome. Yeah, I will. I'm going to find fun. a video. We've got a video specifically of that on YouTube, I believe. I'm going to get that video up there. Uh, let's see here. Let's get into the questions. The first question today comes from Jason Brown. Steve, uh, you ready for this? Yeah, go for All it. All right, let's do it. People say that your trail light saddle and Fabtron's trail light saddle are the same. I caution them. Even if you do make your saddle, uh, your design and bars could be very different. Just because someone makes your saddles doesn't mean they have your design. Do you have anything that you sh that uh, that you can add to this to help me convince them and know that they need a mule saddle with mule saddle bars? Well, there's a there's a big difference in these in my bars uh, and the way the tree's made, and also the way the rigging plates made uh, uh, and, and some also the skirting too. There are several things that are different and, and no, just buying uh, uh, a saddle that's supposed to be similar to it is not going to get it. Folks, it's one thing I, I put my logo in every one of my saddles. So, you know, it's the real thing. That's awesome. So there you go. It's gotta be the real thing. That the conchos too, the Queen Valley Mule Ranch conchos are very, very cool. I like those quite a bit. That's what they're called, right? Yes, yeah, they're yeah. called conchos. I like and those it's, a yeah, lot. It's, you betcha. So Eileen Easterday had a had a question that she posted before we got going. She says, Hello, Stephen Dave. Hello, Eileen. <laughs> what type or brand of spurs do you recommend? We haven't talked about this yet. What do you think, Steve? You know, folks, my spurs are all handmade. Uh, by artisans and you don't want to spend the kind of money that these spurs are worth. I, I it, to me, it's kind of like buying artwork. Uh, the one pair of spurs, I'll just tell you about one pair. I've got one pair and the artisan told me that when he, when he, uh, sent them to me, I helped him train on his mule. So we did some, some trading out there. And when he sent it to me, he sent some, facts with the spurs so I can send it to my insurance company but these spurs are $3,500 so the big thing is with spurs is this and Dave what we ought to do uh, is probably in the next session uh, next week uh, I'll bring some spurs in and show folks yeah that would be but awesome folks, yeah yeah I think it's we need, really need to help because not only the spur but the way the it sets on the boot mm. having a spur shelf there's more to it than just having something on your boot. Sometimes it has a shank like this that it's called a lady leg and it's shaped like that. Some of them are straight. Some of them turn in. Uh, so it depends on where your boot is on the, on the animal. So if your boot is in the center of the animal's body, it's going to be one shank. If your boot is below the belly, it's going to be a lady leg shank, which like I said, it's kind of, it kind of comes up and, and back around. Spurs are, are really mis, uh, misused and misthought of. You know, it, you, you know how I talk about ask, tell, demand. Yeah. Well, you, you ask the mule with the calf, you tell with the side of the stirrup and you demand with the spur. Uh, you, you, the downside is people hit them with the spurs all the time yeah. rather than using the basic com communication skills. Ask, tell, demand, comfortable, uncomfortable. So let me show the spurs. I'm thinking, Dave, uh, uh, I'll look at our schedule, but I'm, I'm thinking it's going to be Thursday of next week because I'll be up in Gillette, Wyoming and we don't have good cell service where yeah. I'm at. So we will, we will work it out. The next time we do this, we'll get those spurs out there. So Eileen, yeah. stay tuned. We're going to get an even better answer for you than the one that we've got today. We have a few more people hopping on. I just want to greet yeah. them real quick. We'll get to the next question. We got Pat Ingram. Hello, Pat. Pat. Yes. We've got yes. Hi, David Scholl. Hello, Steve from Dallin, Dollar Mill. Uh, Australia, 30 degrees Celsius, sunny and a slight breeze, beautiful day. Hello, David. Glad to hear that. Jana yeah. Schmidt, uh, Schmidt. Hi, Steve. I'm here. It's Jana. Hey, Janet. Good to hear. Good. That's Jana I was telling you about. Yes. She uh, yes. watched my show. Yeah. She's pretty awesome. That's awesome. We've got she, Rich Simpson, Agua Dolce, California. Um, yes. Let's see. We've got, uh, let's see. Uh, D. Witt is here. We've got yep. uh, J.C. Greg Eden, and uh, we've got Yolanda here again. So welcome, everybody. We're glad that you guys are here. 
you take a long rope and you go between the legs and make a loop and go around the pasturing. And then you kind of get to one side of the mule and just kind of bump the mule, bump it. And when he puts his foot down solid and doesn't want to move, that left foot is ready for the hobble. Then you take that rope, go around the right foot. Now the right side is looking from behind the mule. This is the right side on the right, left side on the left. It's the near side and the off side. So I just got done working the the uh, left foot. And remember, I want the foot to be still. Now I take it over and I take the loop between the legs and I hold the left side and the right side. And I'm holding it around the pastern and I bump it, I bump it, I bump it. And when the mule keeps his foot quiet, it maybe take three or four times and it's quiet or the donkey keeps quiet then stop. That's step one. Remember, everything is done in threes. So three on the off side, three on the near side. We quit today. Then we, we wait a few days and we do it again. Remember, my training is I don't want any pressure on the animal and I don't want pressure upon uh, the the owner. Uh, the only pressure it's going to be is if it's the, the mule or the donkey because they need to understand who leadership is. So after we do three on the right, three on the left, we do it again. Three or three, six. Next time we train, three, three, nine. Next time we train, three, three, twelve. And folks, the main thing is to watch for is this. On any of your training, if your mules and donkeys get it, you will see them start dropping their head and being relaxed. Do everything in small increments. Don't train every day. Don't do that. Don't try to tighten up your cinch all at one time. Don't try to just throw a set of hobbles on and expect them to stand still. Do the steps. After you do that, after you do uh, 12 on each foot over probably about a two-week time frame, then you go back and you apply the hobbles above the knee to start with. For just a, almost like the count of 60 and then you stop and then uh, you do that over 3, 6, 9, 12. So the first time I'll do it, I'll put the set of hobbles on above the knee. Notice I said above the knee, not down on the pasture. So I'll do that for 60 seconds and then I'll, I'll wait a few minutes. I'll go back and do it again for another 60 seconds. I'll wait a few minutes. I'll go back and do it another 60 seconds. That is enough for the day. Three, six, nine, twelve. And David, this is what it, it gets explained in this weight here. Not only does it teach hobbles, but it teaches grazing hobbles. Now, when you hobble two front feet, folks, that is to stand still and quiet. It is not for grazing. You'll find that mule, that donkey, that horse can run back to the, to the truck or the camp quicker than you can get there. Just because the front feet of hobble don't mean nothing. When you're going to hobble one for feeding a left front, right rear, that's a grazing. And then there's a lot more on that video, David, that has to get done. But it's hard to teach a lot of these things, folks, unless you can get a visual for it. That's why I designed the videos. My clients would come to me yeah. and I would show them and then I would video it so that they would know. And then I started looking at this thinking, you know, more people need to get a hold of this. And that's where we've gone from there. That's awesome. So Donna, I hope, I hope that gives you the answer that you were looking for. As always, feel free to send us a message if you need us to kind of, you know, expand on that answer a little bit. Let's get to the next question here. We've got a question from, um, uh, Jerem Everett says, uh, good day, good evening, gentlemen. Jeremy watching from, Picayune, Mississippi. I've watched many of your videos, but this is the first time tuning in live, and we're really glad that you're here. Thanks, Jeremy. Appreciate it. Um, Absolutely. He says, my question has to do with proper packing and conditioning for mountain trip. I will be going to Lizard Head Wilderness Area in Colorado this August. We will be doing yeah. a 10-day trip, but unfortunately, we'll not be able to bring packing mules with us. Uh, this will be mm. my first time taking a trip like this. Do you have any pointers on packing properly and also how to condition my mule to ride in the mountains when uh, all we have is flat ground to ride around here? I've enjoyed watching your videos and learning from the vast amount of knowledge that you have dealing with mules. Any advice is greatly appreciated. Thank you. What do you have to say there to Jeremy? 
it's you know it's a major thing, Jeremy, when you go from let's say two thousand feet up to eight thousand feet. You can get altitude sickness, and if you can get it, guess what? Your mule, your horse, your donkey will too. So that's one of the biggest things if you're taking animals from Mississippi, Arkansas, a lot of those flat ground places, and you go to to uh, Colorado, especially that lizard head country. Partner, that's some beautiful country. You're going to love it. Straight up, straight down. If you're riding a mule, you're going to be really safe. But going on here... Uh, the biggest thing that we have to consider is that mules are really bad at dehydration. So I'm always a proponent of electrolytes, electrolytes, electrolytes. Folks, when you're going to go traveling, you jump that mule in a trailer and he's going to be in that trailer more than five hours. Go down and get you some electrolytes, stick it in the corner of their mouth, give it to them, jump them in a trailer by the time you get to where you're going to go, your first time of spending the night somewhere, they're going to come out looking for water. And that's imperative. Now, before this, look, folks, before this, and this is for, for you folks as well, is that you hydrate yourself before you go back in the mountains. Hydrate it before. Now, as some of you know, I'm a firefighter uh, volunteer here in, in Queen Valley, and, I, and I'm also a, an EMS technician. And I can't tell you how many people we have gone in to help out that have got themselves dehydrated. They got themselves a little bottle of water for that day. Folks, it's not that day. It's two days beforehand, at least the day before. And, and so that takes care of that part. The next part is tendons. Feel the tendons of your mule. Feel the tendons of your donkey. That tendon, front and rear, should be solid. You should feel it very firm all the way down. Dave, I think we did a video about that this uh, this last clinic we did uh, in uh, uh, trail riding, riding with, with confidence. confidence. Yeah, yeah, where I showed the folks how to feel that tendon. Look, folks, it's called a bowed tendon. It's where the tendon gets overstretched. It's kind of like you twisting your ankle, all except for this bow. This tendon is about about uh, 16, 18 inches long. Well. 12 to 16 inches depends on the the your mules and and, and how they're bred, and so you can get a low, a high bow, a middle bow, and a lower bow. It's it's called a bowed tendon. It's where the tendon gets overstressed, and now it's all puffy. And folks, when that happens, you're pretty much done for all 30, 60, 90 days. You ain't going to go anywhere. And I can't emphasize enough, and this is extremely important, take you a med kit for your mules, donkeys, and horses when you go back in the mountains. That med kit, you should have banamine. I prefer to go in the jugular myself, uh, and, and, but talk to your veterinarian. Get, get yourself either the tube, bana, the tube, or get you the intermuscular, uh, but get the banamine. Your banamine, will save your mules, horses, and donkeys. Ban me. Get that. The other thing you need to have is uh, like Visine. Uh, it's amazing how they'll go into an area with different plants and this sort of thing, and their eyes will get really matty and kind of ugly. Uh, and, and that Visine, like we use on our eyes, is really good to help them out. The last thing I need to have you all have is Butte. Butte. It's extremely important to have butte. I personally, when I give butte, I reach in, I get the tongue, I pull it out, and I shove that butte, butte, butte tablet all the way back in. You can get butte also in a syringe to where you can give it like a paste, but you need banamine and you need butte, and you make sure that you get hydrated. Uh, very important. And look, folks, this summer, you know, with it being high humidity and stuff, you should be using uh, uh, electrolytes all the time. Put it in your water. Give it to them in a the paste. The biggest problem with the majority of these animals that we quote, and, and hey, Dave, this last clinic uh, at the Hoosier, mm -hmm. I had profe at Hoosier, I had professional veterinarians at every single one of my clinics. Yep. Professionals. 
And I mean, that's wonderful. Yes. And it's amazing, Dave, not to pat myself on the back, but I feel good. These professionals come up to me and said, Steve, you hit it right on the money. Thank you for telling people what to do. Yeah. Okay. Which is awesome. Thank you. And now the other thing, folks, last thing, I need you to call your veterinarian or go somewhere and get this information. Find out what your heart and respiration looks like. Extremely important. Heart and respiration. And that way, when you do get in trouble, uh, a lot of our people who who they think the, the meal is colic, and they can colic. Don't listen to people who say they won't. They will. Uh, they they can definitely do that. They're not really colicking. They're dehydrated. They get very, very concerned. They look at water. They smell water. Take some of your own water with you. And especially if you put uh, electrolytes in the water, they'll smell it and look at it. When we used to go to Bishop, that was about, oh, about 14, 16 hours trip, pulling a 40-foot uh, trailer with mules. We used to take our, our mules and we would take and use uh, the electrolytes in the water to to get them started a week or so ahead of time. Actually, we did it really before then, but at least a week ahead of time. And then we took water with us. And when we got to Bishop, we used some of their water, some of our water, and away we went. Awesome. So I went ahead and I put the three words uh, that you said, the banamine, the visine, and the butte. I put that in the comment section so folks can... Uh, remember that and they don't feel like, man, what was it that he was talking about? I put it in there. Y'all can search, uh, you know, banamine, equine, visine, equine, butte, equine, and it'll come up with what it is you're looking for. And if you have any specific questions, feel free to send Steve an email, steve at muleranch.com. Please. Yeah, we're, we're here to help, Dave. So the next question that I have is a real quick one. Andon Ficker says, where are your saddles made, Steve? I have all of my saddles are made in the United States. Uh, the specific Name of the companies, I do not share that at all. And that is from, from actually the companies that I, that make my saddles. Um, they ask, it was part of my contract uh, with them, uh, for not to share the specific companies, but everything is made in the United States. Awesome. There you go, Andon. So the next question that I have, and this one's from me. So this is a question I have. I need to learn too. Okay. You've always talked about the need to always ride with the britchin, even on flat lands. I still don't know why. Can you explain to me why I always need to ride with a britchin? Well, specifically it's this. Mules, it's the way they're built. Their bone structure is donkey. So their shoulders are V-shaped. So it's not the wither that keeps the saddle in a place. A wither is from going right to left, not going forward. Notice on a horse that if you don't put a breast collar on it, the saddle will go back toward the hip. Why is that? They are hourglass belly toward their hip, and they are A-shaped in their shoulders. So because of that, it makes no difference, flat ground or mountains, your saddle is going to go on top of the scapula. Now, Connie, that was just in my uh, clinic here at Hoosier, she had a nice mule, Dave. Oh, multi-million dollar mule just in disposition alone. Yeah. Oh, this is a sweet mule. Sweet mule. That's great. She said, she said, I've had this mule for two years, and it's got to where it won't do nothing for me, doesn't even want to come to me, nothing. And I said, oh, my, that's terrible. She, I said, uh, I said uh, where do you live? And she said, uh, Illinois. And I said, how far are you from Indianapolis? She said, three and a half hours. I said, if you bring your mule to the, to the clinic, I'll, I'll change that for you. I'll tell you what, Connie, we got to get her on this thing. She will tell you that mule met her at the gate every day there at the, at the show. Her biggest thing was she didn't have a rear cinch. She didn't have a breaching. And when she came to me, I wished I had taken pictures of it, Dave. I, I just, I didn't do it. I should have. I but was sending you messages all throughout the week, and I said, give me pictures. Give me pictures. So for next time. Yeah, I get, I get so, I see the poor meal, and I'm thinking, I just got to help you, yeah. you know. Yes. And, and, and anyway, uh, uh, I tell you what, I'll contact Connie and see if she'd be nice enough, I'm sure she will, to put the saddle up on the scapula and this sort of thing. 
uh, and so that we can see it. I mean, she would, she said, wow, I can't believe the difference. And Dave, it blew her away when I used the come along hitch to get the mule to stand still. The come along rope was laying on the ground. I didn't touch it. I took a big blue tarp and put it all over that mule and the mule stood perfectly quiet. Yep. She said, I can't even put the saddle on it without the mule chasing all around. She would tie the mule to a, a high post mm-hmm. and the mule would come to the end of it and, and couldn't go no farther. When I showed her what was going on around, I took him, turned the mule loose and I started to put the pad up. The mule immediately, immediately left immediately. And she left because her back was sore and I showed him, I run my hand down it and, uh, I palpated the back and a couple of veterinarians in in the uh, audience spoke up and said, that mule back is sore and that mule shoulder is sore. You know, oh, Dave, I meant to tell you, too, uh, there was a pathologist there, veterinarian pathologist, uh-huh. where they open these animals up. Yes. He said, Steve, tell these people about the scapula. You tell them about it, how it goes up and down. Yep. You're correct. He said, but tell them that the very end is very sharp. And and he give me this piece of paper right here. Okay. And he says, do you see how how narrow this is right here? He said, that's the top of the scapula. He says, as it pounds on that scapula, it bends it over. He said, Steve, it literally bends it over. Then it stresses out all the mount, the 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 tendons and the muscles and stuff. Yeah. And he gave me this and said, that's the top of the scapula, Steve. That's what it looks like. Folks ain't a lot there. No, he says, he said, you put a 30 pound saddle on that and tighten up the cinch. That's a lot. And then you put a hundred pound person on top of it. It don't take long. He said, literally, it bends it right open. Yeah. I, it blew me away, Dave. I learned something more at, at one of these clinics. You well, know? That, I mean, that's, that's pretty much your, uh, your MO, continually learning, continuing adjusting, continuing growing. And that's why we continue yeah. to do these things here because we got to pass along that information. So that was helpful. I appreciate you answering that about uh, Britchen. Um, Denise from Michigan, who was at your Why Does My Mule Do That clinic, she actually had a question about that too. And so I said, I said, you know what, Denise, I need to ask him about that. I said, shh, don't tell anybody that I don't know. I'm going to ask him about that and we'll get him to answer it for both of us. So I'll make sure to give her a link to that. The next question that I have here comes from Jana and she says, Steve, can you talk a little bit about the right brain, left brain aspect of the mule and then go ahead and compare it to a horse for me, please and thank you. The right brain, left brain, horse, mule, donkey, all the same. What they don't have is the cranial lobe that tells the right side what the left side's doing, the left side what the right side's doing. So, and their, their eyes are wide apart too. So when you get close, they, they have to turn like this to be able to see you to see the whole of you. So uh, that's basically it, Jana. Jana's the one I was telling you about that uh, I called and just to thank her for, right. for uh, she bought new some bits and some videos. And she says, Steve, she says, you must have been, we're, we're telegraphically touching each other. She said, I was just thinking, wow, Steve taught me how to do this. I loaded my uh, my my donkey in 15 minutes, called my husband. He says, no, nah, you didn't do that. She says, I can't wait to, to show you when you get home. That's fun. Yeah. You know, that's what I'm here for. That's great. Awesome. So the next question that we have is from Yolanda and uh, it's a little bit long. So let me get through it and then hopefully you'll have a good answer here. Um, I have a question that bothers me a lot. It doesn't have anything to do with mules in particular, but more of a health question about buying a horse. So we'll go ahead and talk about it here. We are looking for a good horse for my daughter and found one, but she has a fishbone back where the kidneys are and she is peeing in short parts and the pee color is brownish instead of clear yellow. Is it Uh, correct that she has to do with the fact that her kidneys are not good because she is from Spain and she is approved breeding mare? But if she is approved, what is she doing here in our country at a horse dealer stable? So that gives me that she is no more good for breeding than that something has happened to her and put her in this situation she is now. For the record, my Spanish mule is doing fine. <laughs> so any any comments there, Steve? <laughs> well, when your urine is dark, you're in trouble, especially when it's with a mule, a donkey, a horse in your equines. When it's 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 the muscles that are putting out an acid, and I don't know the exact name for it, 
but it goes through the kidneys. And when the kidneys are starting to be dark, i.e., uh, I, coffee color, that mule, that horse, that donkey is in trouble, deep trouble. Folks, always when you're purchasing a mule, I had a guy call me today. He said he's going to go to so and so, uh, sale. There's going to be a lot of mules there. What should I look for? I said, part of you ain't got enough time for me to go ever through everything, <laughs> but let me just kind of share a couple of things. Watch the mule when he takes a leak. Oh, that kind of blows people away. Listen, look at the color. The lighter color that is, the, the healthier that animal is. Look at his poop. The greener, the shinier, the better. If it's real shiny, that horse, that mule, that donkey is hydrated. Yes, sir. So, uh, if he's raftered back there in that hip, that, 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 uh, donkey sounds like, that horse sounds like, uh, uh, aceteria. And, and it's not good because they will die. And folks, you know, I, I, there are some that sell mules and donkeys and are right up front and, and tell you the truth. Yeah. Unfortunately, there are some that only go by what somebody else told them. I want to see it black and white. And that's why in all my clinics, I don't just say it. I show it. You right. can visually see it. Right. There you are. Fantastic. Okay, so the next question is from Jermaine, who's been just an awesome, awesome friend here on Facebook. Jermaine's been asking all sorts of questions, really active. So thank you so much, Jermaine. I appreciate that. And uh, Jermaine says, if your mule stomps his foot, is that a warning or is that boredom? Well, if he stomps his foot, he's usually trying to get a fly or a gnat off his leg or front foot. Usually a back foot that will stomp a lot, but... Uh, is, does your, does your mule have, uh, have a lot of flies? Like, does it have any places on his chest or in his legs where it's kind of, uh, you can see bl blood spots and that sort of thing? So what about the mule that we had at trail riding with confidence hanging out over there on the hitching post and just kept pawing at the, uh, just kept pawing at the thing? Is that considered stomping of the foot or is that just considered pawing? No, that's considered pawing. Okay. That, the pawing is, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. Uh, and some, I had a guy, uh, uh, text me today, actually emailed today, wanted to know how that chain looked and how we did it. And I told him, uh, to go on my YouTube and, and probably see that over there. But the pawing is, I don't want to be there. The stomping is usually, uh, they've got a fly or something pestering them. There you go. So, uh, Jermaine, if you want to give a little bit more uh, um, information there that Steve was asking for, we'll get back to it. Uh, Cindy Calloway uh, says she goes, love Steve Saddles. That's all she wrote. So I figured you'd like to hear that. She says, love Steve Saddles. Uh, let's get down here. And uh, the next question that I have is about bits. Uh, and this comes from Denise from Michigan as well. And, oh, before we get into that, uh, Jermaine says, not flies, I was saddling. Not flies, I was saddling. Hmm. Was it a front foot or a back foot? Jermaine, front foot or back foot? Which one was it? Uh, front. Okay, here we go. Front. Front. Front foot. Uh, did she tighten the rear cinch first or the front cinch first? <laughs> front cinch first, rear cinch first, and any other information that you might want to know, Steve? No, that'll probably do it because if there's no flies then she's probably tightening the front cinch too tight. Front. Uh, or in too much. Yep, you says know. front cinch first. Uh, yeah, okay, that's why then. On a mule, when you when you cinch them up, always snug up the back one first, and the front one, you just barely put it down. What's happening is when she tightens it up, it's pulling down upon that, that, uh, that fat pocket area in behind the scapula, and the mule's probably a little sore, so uh, I would strongly suggest anytime you're saddling a mule, number one, you want your back cinch to be wide, not narrow. Anytime you're saddling a mule, donkey or horse, always saddle up in stages. And if your mule's never had a, a back cinch on, and people's heard me say this before, do it slowly in small stages, small stages. Just, just tight, put a little bit snug. Walk the mule around, come around again, pull it up a little bit tighter, walk the mule around. 
The back cinch is always the tightest. Front cinch is the loosest. And you should have saw it, Dave, in this clinic. This lady was sitting in the saddle. I run my arm clear through the cinch. And you can see the people in the audience, their eyes got real big like, that's really loose. And I looked at the lady and she was riding her saddle, not mine. Mm -hmm. I asked the lady, I said, I said, roll back and forth. What does it feel like to you? And she says, well, it really feels solid. See, I took and put one of my wide cinches on the back uh -huh. and that made it solid. Uh, and so we just didn't have her move around much because in just a matter of a, a few minutes, Dave, her not having a rear cinch or a breaching, the saddle came forward. Mm -hmm. Then I readjusted it. I tightened up the back cinch only, still didn't have a breaching. She went around the same amount of runs and the saddle stayed in pretty decent place. It only probably moved, oh, a little bit less than a half an inch. Mm -hmm. But on flat ground or not, folks, it's going to move because of the way mules, moves, mules stride. So before we go to Denise's question then, because you're talking about cinches, the next one that I have um, that I want to ask, this one comes from uh, Deborah from Facebook. She says, um, uh, well, let's see, is it this one? Yes. I need help with a cinch. I bought a fleece should, I brought a fleece should relief cinch. Um, it's starting to irritate and rub her hair off. I have crates reining saddle that seems to work everywhere else. Is there a way to cross the front and front and back cinch so the front cinch lays further back or try another type of cinch? I can't really afford a new saddle. The mule is a borrow, uh, borrow at this point, although I've become smitten with her. What, what would you have to say there? <laughs> She has a bad case of mule osis now. Smitten is another way to say it. <laughs> uh, okay, here's the deal, folks. Fleece line things only turns into sandpaper. Uncle Bud, years ago, he put new fleece on his breechings and on his cinches and on his breast collar. He said, man, they're going to be in good shape now. By the time this was in Arizona and it was really a, a hot day and there was a lot of salt coming off the animals, by the time we got 18 miles into camp, they were being rubbed right down. That fleece turns into sandpaper from the salt from the animals, folks. So here's the deal. Uh, Crates makes an awesome saddle, very nice saddle. It, you've got to remember that front cinch cannot be tight. It's imperative the back cinch is. I tell people, take that saddle. Take your billets off, which is the two long straps in the back. Take those off. Put on nylon tie straps. Put a four inch wide cinch on the back. Put about a four to six inch hobble strap from the back cinch to the front cinch. And then when you put your breeching on, make sure that the breeching, the hip plate is in the center of the hip between the dock and the tail point of the croup. And uh, and that your breaching is fairly straight for flat ground, tipped at, at an angle for mountains. But don't tighten that front cinch and get rid of that fleece. It's going to be like sandpaper. You think you got problems now? You'll have more later. Um, Dave, I spent a lot of years trying to figure out how to get rid of cinch rash, uh -huh. and uh, we we had it really bad up the Grand Canyon. We washed our cinches every time. We took them off of the animals. They immediately went into Clorox. They immediately went into a washer dryer thing. And we put clean cinches on their mules every single time. And we still had the problem. Yeah. And the big problem was we didn't have it with my saddles, all right? Uh, but the big problem was they would tighten that front cinch. Those guys... A lot of the a lot of the guys up there are, are they're great cowboys, good riders, but they use the horse technique and tighten the front cinch. Yeah. You know, look at that front cinch; it's at an angle. You know. Awesome. Um, so we've got a couple more people uh, chiming in here. We've got Judy Doomerwork, Doomermuth, uh, hi from Ellsworth, Wisconsin. We've got uh, Carla Howe. Sorry, I'm late. I've been cutting grass. We're glad you're here, Carla. Cut grass. Hi, Carla. Good to see you. And we've got Linda Kramer who says hi from Missouri. We're glad to have you here, Linda. Yeah, Linda's been a client of mine several years. And hey, you folks from Wisconsin, one of these days I want to come up there and do a clinic. Put the word in for me for that Wisconsin Expo. Uh, I sure would like to get in there. And folks, on these expos, it takes you. 
It takes you. You tell those expos what clinicians you like. Yep. Uh, the Southern uh, Expo, I got great ratings at this Hoosier right now. They said they've got more emails about my clinics than any clinician was there. And there were some great ones there this time. And I'm, I just got an email from them saying, wow, we got all these emails from happy clients. Thanks, folks. Is you know, it the Midwest Horse out. Fair in Wisconsin? Uh, I haven't done it. No, this was Hoosier, this last one No, no, one the did. one that's in Wisconsin that you were talking about. I'm not sure what the name of that one is in Wisconsin. Well, let's get you in that uh, one, too. <laughs> yeah, we need, to, we need to do that. Midwest, I have done it there before. It's probably been six, seven years back at Midwest, and that was in Kansas uh, when when I did that one. But the one in Wisconsin, I've heard a lot of good feedback. I've had a lot of my clients say, why aren't you there? Folks, it takes you uh, to to help us out as clinicians, all of us guys, all of us gals. Uh, you know, you write them, you tell them the good, bads, and uglies. They need to hear it all, please. Yeah. So Jermaine uh, has a couple follow-ups, and I told I told Jermaine to actually give you a call and send some pictures because I know that you'll want to spend a little bit more time um, one-on-one. Yes. One. But uh, says, I was mostly worried that this was a warning of an impending kick. Um, and says that I'm using both cinches, saddle and saddle pad um, are all yours, and I'm and I'm putting the front on first, but I'm not doing it tight. So I'm figuring this is something you may want to talk a little bit more one on one to to solve it and make sure that everything is good to go. Yeah, and if she wants to send some pictures, she can. Here's here's the downside, and she'll probably see it this summer. A lot of you will probably see it this summer, especially if. Uh, if saddles that are not working on the animal's back shows up, and 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 even mine too, if you over tighten that front cinch this spring when all that winter hair shows shows off, you're going to see salt and pepper uh, white and dark uh, coloration in the hairs. That's from over tightening the front cinch. Jermaine, take your rear cinch first, rear cinch first, and put it up and snug it up, just snug. Just barely be touching the bottom of the belly. Then put your front one on and have it be where you can see daylight through it. Because here's the thing. I think that mule is telling you, and you probably need to go to a chiropractor and find out. I think this mule is telling you that I could have a problem in my shoulder or I could have a problem in my back. And also, Dave, ask her about uh, if her teeth were floated on this animal too. Good question there for you, Jermaine. The teeth been floated? Um, and so while we're waiting for that, we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll continue to move on and we're going to get to the bit question now. So the question from Denise was, I'm getting ready to buy tack for my little mule and I've been training for trail riding. Which bit? If we're, if she started out with a mule riders martingale, I think that's what she took when she left here in Arizona. If she started there, she needs to stay with it. Go out on a trail with a mule riders martingale. That Mule Riders Martingale has saved my hide from bears, uh, from wild cattle, from just bronchy mules. That Mule Riders Martingale has helped me out. And I wish I'd have had it, uh, especially during some of my wrecks. You know, as some of you know, I've had 32 broken bones and, and two replaced hips over my, oh, <laughs> yeah, over my 50 some years of cowboy. And it can happen. Awesome. So, so Mule I'll Riders make- Martingale. Let me just give the process. Six months, you're going to ride in a mule rider's martingale. In the mountains, on the trails, in the round pen. In three months, if you can one-handed pick up on the rain, where normally when you're riding a snaffle bit, you are riding direct raining, both hands. If you can one-handed back up two steps, one-handed go to the right, one-handed go to the left, one-handed stop. You're ready to start introducing my trail rider bit. And your little mule would carry about a, a five and a quarter. Awesome. Mouthpiece. I'll make sure that she gets that. I'll make sure that she gets the link. Um, the next question that I have uh, comes in from, uh, oh, real quick. Uh, we had uh, Judy say that it, the, Miss, the Wisconsin one is the Midwest Horse Fair. Uh, J.C. Gregg Eden said Miss Midwest Horse Fair as well. And uh, guess who just chimed in? Ooh. David, David Pingali. Hey, the coffee man. Coffee man. Yes, he sir. Says, awesome he coffee. says, check your email tonight. I need your thoughts on a mule. Can I trade you some coffee for your input? 
<laughs> oh, I tell you what, Dave, I'm gonna I'm gonna get, fix this one up. I'm gonna have him send you the coffee. Yes. You know? Yes. David Payne Gallagher's a pretty awesome guy. He almost got burnt, but a Christian man that was gonna sell him the mule said, You know what, David? This mule's not working out. Here's your money back. A Christian man done that. That's pretty awesome. That is awesome. David, it's good to have you here again. The next question that I got comes from Linda Kramer. She just typed in. She says, how long after floating the teeth and removing a wolf tooth can they put be put back on the bit? I, I usually will do it about uh, four to five days later, you know, uh, and, and they usually will do just fine. If we're talking a, a snaffle bit, uh, that's going to be tongue communication and bar communication. So I'd say four to five days. If you are riding in one of my finished bits or a finished bit with palate communication, you could probably do it in three because you're not putting as much pressure upon the bars uh, or on the tongue at all. So that's be my suggestion. Awesome. There you go. So the next question that I have here, just moving right along, is uh, synthetic mule saddle. And so I've never heard the word synthetic mule saddle. Not to say that, you know, it's it's not something that's real. I'm sure it is. I just have never heard it. We had someone say, uh, I need a 14-inch synthetic mule saddle. What is a synthetic mule saddle and what's the opposite of a synthetic mule saddle? Synthetic mule saddle means a saddle made out of Corridura, which is my trail light saddle. The one that is not synthetic is an all leather saddle. So the Corridura is 650 PSI per square inch. It's 2000 Lear, which is the toughest you can get when it comes to Corridura. Your leather is 450 PSI per square inch. And I learned this from some, uh, from different saddle makers in my expos who, who, who shared with me their knowledge, which is what, what I love to do. Awesome. So that answers that question there. The next question that I have, we're rolling right along here is, uh, um, what yeah. should we feed a 10 month old donkey? We have a, we have four miniature donkeys who get nothing but pasture, hay and minerals. Today we bought a 10 month old mini mule. Does he need grain? This is from Mary on Facebook. Mary, I never suggest grain for mules or donkeys. They don't need the carbohydrates, i.e. the sugar. The problem with the donkeys, the biggest problem that we have is that, uh, I thought somebody was knocking on my door. It's Jess. Jess, that'll do. Jess, here. My, my buddy Jess, my, my border collie puppy is in the room is with Jess me. Is Jess there? And, <laughs> yeah, Jess is here. Jess here. Jess here. Up, up here. 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 There, there he is. There's there my is. buddy Jess. Boy, did I miss him! I'll bet. I was gone for a week. I missed my puppy. Yep, he's a great. Yep. Okay, dog. so I lost my question. Now help me out. I got yeah, yeah. About no, my that's puppy. that's fine. That's when Jess makes an appearance, we stop everything, make sure Jess is welcome, and so uh, we'll get back to it. Synthetic mule saddle. You were talking about what you had learned from uh, other saddle manufacturers at the different clinics, expos, fairs, and things that you have gone to, and that's where we left off. You bet. Saddle manufacturers, saddle makers that are, you know, the, the craftsmen that make one at a time. Those guys, uh, those guys are artists, Dave. I mean, if, if you really want art, uh, they hand carve everything, yada, yada. My saddles are cut out with machines and then they are hand put together by companies that have been doing it since the 1950s. Uh, and, and a couple of their companies there. Uh, that makes some of my stuff uh, that, you know, the grandkids are doing it. The dads are doing it. Grandpas are doing it. Great grandma's doing it. It's a family operation and all of them are Christian as well. So I have learned from other saddle makers and other companies. Uh, when I go to these expos, I listen to other companies, what they have to say. And I, I learn a lot, uh, Dave, it's, it's pretty awesome, but that's how I learned about the, the PSI per square inch and stuff. That's awesome. Great. So the next question that I have then is, uh, oh, <laughs> you know what? I lost my train of thought too. It was actually uh, the question that we'd moved on to is what should we feed that 10-month-old donkey? Oh, God, oh, yeah, I hit that. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the 10-month-old donkey needs all the grass hay you can put in front of them. Now, here's one of the downsides, folks, is people just buy hay. 
The downside is this. We don't know what's in the hay. You know, what kind of, what kind of zinc, what kind of ABCs, you know, this sort of thing. Don't just feed a mineral block and think he's going to get his minerals. It's a waste of money to buy a mineral block. I have listened to professionals, uh, that are in the business and they say you don't get the right kind of minerals in those blocks to, and, and it's not worth it, that kind of money for that block. They say get a hair analysis, get a blood test, find out what the mule donkey needs and then feed them vitamins and minerals. So what that baby needs, all that baby needs is a good quality hay. No mule, no donkey, and no horse really, but especially mules and donkeys don't need to be eating grain every day. It adds to the fat pockets along the crest of the neck. It adds to the fat pockets on top of the ribs, and it adds to the fat pockets along the dock of the tail. Uh, if when I feed grain, David, the only time I do is when I get ready to go on a ride uh -huh. or get ready to hook my mules and my donkeys into the harness uh -huh. because that's when they need it. When they're going up the side of a mountain or right. pulling a wagon, right. they need that energy. It's the only time. That makes sense. Uh, JC Greg Eden says, for everyone out there not sure about what tack to use, make sure you talk to Steve. Uh, him and Susan are so much help. So we appreciate that so much. Um, and yes, I can yes. tell you, Steve is always willing and always happy to help. Uh, uh, Eileen Easterday says, Jess is growing. He sure is. Yes. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's, I, he makes me pretty proud. Yeah. So the question about uh, the synthetic saddle came actually from uh, Diane Christensen. And so uh, Diane says, I think my 13.1 uh, mule would benefit from a lightweight saddle. So hopefully that answered your question yeah. well there. Uh, the next question that I have here um, is uh, uh, about mule breast collars. And I had a question come in from uh, Cassie on Facebook and, and she says, um, is the beta breast collar a pulling collar type? So one, I don't know what a pulling collar type is. And two, is yours a pulling collar type? So explain what a pulling collar type is and then explain what yours is. <laughs> okay. When a, when a mule is walking, as they walk with their shoulders, when the shoulder hits the breast collar, it's saying, saddle, stay forward. And you've got a breaching that says saddle don't go forward much. A, a, a pulling collar comes from two straps from the pommel down to the collar. My collar and what it does then as it pulls. And Dave, we done some uh, videoing on this, uh, for YouTube. Yep. Uh, and I demonstrated the yep. differences. So people need to see it. My breast collar follows the slope of the shoulder. Perfect. But then I've got a strap that makes an X around the horn. And then my long strap for my breast collar goes through that strap that I tied in around the pommel, buckles in, and then it goes back and forth, right, left, right, left. And it keeps from pulling the saddle forward until you're dragging something or until you're going up a hill. The downside of pulling collars is it pulls the saddle forward. Now, here's your test, folks. Go test this. Remember, I always tell you, do a visual. Your saddle can move an inch and a half forward, back, left, and right. So when you adjust your breaching at an inch and a half, you adjust your breast collar at an inch and a half. Then go for a ride. Go for a ride for 15 minutes and then 30 minutes and measure that breast collar. You're going to see that that pulling collar is going to pull that saddle forward. Awesome exactly what I needed to know. Let's just r uh, rumble through these last couple questions here. Um, the next one that I have is uh, McClellan Saddle. I think you mentioned this a little bit already, but it's Andrija from uh, Croatia says, hey, from Croatia, I have a question. Can mules uh, ride with a McClellan Saddle? You know, they, they made a mule saddle uh, when they did the McClellan Saddle. The actual mule saddle has a brass a horn on it. That's how you know. And it was mostly the packers that rode in a mule saddle and it has a brass horn. I actually owned one of those one time. It was made in 1901 and, uh, and it didn't fit worth a darn. Uh, matter of fact, probably it, it was more on the edges, the first two inches along the bottom that set. 
The downside of the McClellan saddle, Dave, is it only has a single rig on it. So it's center fired. So this it's got a strap that goes in the back D-ring, front D-ring, comes down, and then it's one strap. This single center fire strap makes the saddle roll. As that mule starts, as that donkey starts walking, pretty soon they start shrinking. As they do, that scent starts coming away from the animal. When folks get off, they fall off. And unfortunately, I've had several of my clients that have emailed me. And, and you know, Dave, it's really easy to get hurt around an equine. You open the gate and yeah. you're putting your life in danger. OK, uh, so I've had many people say they've had Australian saddles uh -huh. uh, that they've center fired or they've taken their horse saddle and center fired it or they've had a McClellan and center fired it. And it was inevitable. Every every single person. That when they contacted me or when I seen it in my clinics, every single person said it rolled when they got off. And at least uh, I'm going to say 10 percent of them were pretty seriously hurt. One guy got dragged because his foot got hung up in the stirrup. Man, well, that answers the question then. And I'll make sure to get back with Adri uh, Adrija. I think that's how you say it. Um, let's wrap up. I've got uh, let's see. Let's just do these uh, mule weight. Lydia from Facebook says, I have a small mule, approximately 12 hands high, whose butt measures 30 inches. I need a bridging for her. A saddle as well, right. but need to wait for that. She is overweight, and I would like to ride her more. She weighs about 600 pounds. How much weight would you recommend she carry? Well, you know, folks, it all depends on the conditioning of that mule, their conditioning, how good their tendons are and this sort of thing. And, and, and this is what I tell you folks. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm a prime example of being overweight and 68 years old. <laughs> when I put a pack on my back and I go whack walking, I just did uh, some training for wild line, uh, wildland firefighting. I had to go three miles with 45 pounds on my back in 45 minutes. And it was tough. I was sweating like somebody sprayed me with a water hose. I did it in 45 minutes and eight, eight, 45 minutes and eight seconds. So I just barely made it. <laughs> so I tell you all this, folks, conditioning, conditioning, conditioning. Just because it's 16 hands high or 13 hands high, conditioning. Uh, my very best friend, Andy Anderson, uh, rated, weighed about 240 when he had a 14-2 mule. He rode that mule for over 15 years. And old Beaner, I mean, took him everywhere. And he was only 14 too, and Andy was a big man at 240 pounds. So conditioning, conditioning, fill the tendons before and after rides and that sort of thing. And yes, I've got a bridge in to help you out. Awesome. Got two more and then we'll call it a, then we'll call it a day. This one is all about behavior problems from Sharon on Facebook. Sharon says, if you purchase a mule, quote unquote, said to be wonderful, and you have him shipped, and you find out he has some issues. Are those issues fixable? My new John mule has extreme herd behavior. I paid good money for this mule by a notable ranch. I like his loving attitude. He loves to be with you, but when he is put in a trailer, he will paw to death to get out. I've never owned a mule that is scared inside of a horse trailer. What do you have to say? It's not so much that he's scared. I mean, it's possible, but usually it is. I don't want to be here. Anytime they're pawing, they want something. They paw ice to get to water. They paw snow to get to grass or they paw at a hitch and rail because they don't want to be there. And, and Dave, both mules in my clinic at Hoosier both had, uh, uh, problems with, with, with not with other animals when they seen a horse go by. Man, they jerked the, the ladies around and they brayed and they threw a fit. Yeah. And we had the come long hitches on them in the ground on groundwork. We had that first hour. We were right at a big, uh, uh, opening door and horses were coming and going. So them mules were constantly wanting to be with the herd. That is their nature. They're herd bound because it's their nature. Can you? Fix it permanently? No. It's their nature. So you have to give them a button. So I put the come along rope on them. And that first hour, they had lots of problems. The second hour, one of the mules says, it ain't worth my nose being sore. 
to say a word or look at the horse. At the end of the second hour, the second mule was doing better. And then by the third hour, the next day when we started training, when those horses were going and coming, they rarely looked at them. So can you fix herd, herd bound? No, it is their nature. Can you, uh, can you put cues on it like with your bridle and with the come long hitch? Yes. Yes, you can. You can't take away, uh, what the good Lord put into those animals. Now, the pawing, uh, it's a big deal. You take a, a, a big strap and put it above the animal's knee. You take about 16 inches of heavy chain, heavy chain and put it above the knee and let the animal paw. And when he paws, that chain bangs on his cannon bone. All right. As soon as he quits pawing, take it off immediately. Will the chain slip down off and go down to the pasture? And yes, several times. And yes, you'll have to put it back up. And hey, folks, this is dangerous. Anytime you're working around any animals, this danger, anytime you pick up a foot or get down around one of them, they could puff at a fly and your head's in the way. Helmets, 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 helmets. Wear a helmet. That's one of the things that so many people said when I was out doing my clinic in the Hoosier. Yeah. Wow, you're the first cowboy we ever seen that wears a helmet. So hopefully that answers the question. Uh, I think, Dave, we did that one uh, video when that uh, trail riding with confidence and the folks from Arkansas. Yeah. yeah. Maybe Mike can help him there. Absolutely. Um, so I've got one more question before we do that. Do me a favor real quick, Steve. We have a glitch on, on a uh, Skype. Can you look at your computer, push the camera button and then push the camera button one more time. The audio and the video are, are not synced up well. And I want to make sure that I can use these for YouTube afterwards so folks can get it. So push that camera button. Then okay, push I've done again. that. Yep. That's it. Okay. That's what I needed. Okay. Oh, there it is. Now it's on. Okay, that's you it. want the microphone too? Nope, that's it. That's exactly what I need. Right. Thank you for doing that. So uh, the okay. last question I have, and then uh, um, Jackie and Jackie Greg Eden sent in uh, one final question that we'll answer. And uh, so my last question is uh, comes in from uh, Marlena from Facebook, and this is a really, really important one. So I want to make sure folks listen. Hello, and thank you in advance for your time. I have a mule. She is four, and I cannot handle her safely. She is fine through the fence, but as soon as she sees the halter, she's gone. She is smart. She is strong. And my goal for her is to be safely handled for vetting and footwork, all of which are due. Please advise. I'm a school teacher with limited time and funding. What would you have to say there for Marlena? You know, when you got one, Eileen, that doesn't want to be with you and uh, they do fine with treats. Hey, hey, give me a treat. And then you bring the halter and they decide to leave. They don't want to spend any time with you. And you're probably better off finding a mule that says, hey, Eileen, good morning. How are you? Oh, I'd like to have that halter. Bring it over here. Oh, the saddle, good deal. But if you show one a halter and they say I'm done with you, you could have some other problems, especially if they're on the other side of the corral and don't want nothing to do with you. Uh, and don't get me wrong. It's a difference between one that doesn't want to be caught and one that doesn't want anything to do with you. Eileen, it doesn't cost any more. Folks, listen to me. It doesn't cost any more to have a a well-mannered, good disposition meal as it does a sorry one. I don't care what color it is. I don't care how pretty it is. Folks, it's amazing how many, just in Hoosier this weekend, they first told me it was a good-looking meal and how pretty it was. I want to hear... It's got a great disposition and can't wait to see me. That's that's the that's the kind of mule you're looking for. That's the kind of mule that wouldn't hurt you uh, intentionally. Uh, do they all bite? Yes. Do they all kick? Yes. Do they all run off? Yes. Folks, it's an equine. It's what the good Lord designed in them for flight and fright. We're a predator. They're a prey animal. So my suggestion is find that mule a home. Or take it to a professional and see how it goes. But listen, Eileen, if that mule doesn't want anything to do with you through the corral, I, I'd i be very hesitant going in that corral. Yeah. I think the one thing to underscore there is you cannot take their nature out of them. And you cannot make no. equine training safe. 
It's always dangerous. Yeah. You can do things oh. to be safe about it, to go about the safest way possible, but it is always going to be dangerous when you are working with equine. That's right. They make helmets and vests for a reason. Right, know? absolutely. So let's do the last final question. We went a little bit long today, but uh, but folks have been watching. We've had uh, probably – We've got 22 people still watching right now. We've had as many as, I think, 29 watching today, which is just fantastic. These get viewed by hundreds and hundreds of people, so we're glad to do it. The last question is, I've been told that a John Mule doesn't get his brain until they're eight years old and a Molly about five. Is there any truth to this? You know, folks, I've heard people say over and over and over and over again, I prefer a John or I prefer a Molly. Uh, Molly's are better than John's, yada, yada. I have had sorry John mules. I have had awesome John mules. I have trained sorry Molly mules and sorry John mules and awesome Molly mules. It makes no difference. They completely get their bone growth and their growth and their final mindset at seven years old. I've seen that consistently. I have trained hundreds uh, as Dr. Miller said one time, maybe even thousands of meals. I don't, I kept getting track. But, but uh, folks, the big thing is, is when they're babies is when you start training them. Halter work, picking up their feet, vet work, all of that stuff. By the time that mule is three years old, he should already have a super idea of what's going on. Should not have any problems with a shoer. Could, should not have any problems with a vet. Should not have any problems that come to you. You know, if that foundational training was done right from the day that they imprinted that animal until that three years old, if everything was done correctly, everything should go smooth. If you look at my video of uh, uh, Colt Foundation starting, Dave, mm -hmm. every one of those horses or mules in there were, were, were basically had a lot of good foundational training to them from – from uh, imprinting up, and every one of them people, all five of those people that rode were not professionals. This is the first time they rode one, and because things were done right when they were babies, and then the foundational training we did to prepare them for their first rides, everything went smooth. I cannot emphasize enough, get Dr. Miller, Dr. Robert Miller's books on imprinting, imprint them babies. Awesome. That's it. So let's do one thing before we sign off. Let's see that business card again. Well, another thing too, uh, I haven't had any hat, uh, hat comments. Okay. <laughs> now, Steve wants know, some hat uh, comments, y'all. Yeah, you know, I uh, I know there's some folks out there that kind of comment about hats and stuff. I've got a bunch of them. It kind of depends on the part of the country. But hey, uh, I like to get comments on the hats. Which one of these hats you like the best? You know. Uh, the, this one here is, uh, is a, uh, uh, Montana type, cre uh, uh, crest on it. This is the Montana type cut and it's an awesome hat. Here's the knife. First 25 people that email me, I will send them. I will pay for the freight, the shipping and all. Be sending three day priority. You get my super knife serrated. It is, it is an awesome knife, folks. I mean, hey, just look at that serrated it is awesome that puppy can flat cut and notice that da, 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 queen valley mule ranch on there you see that by golly you got everything right there 25 people the first 25 people now dave didn't you tell me that we had we started out several weeks ago at like 400 people watching it and got upwards of 4,000 people yeah, watching it over a, a week's time. We've had several videos that have gone over 2,000. We had one that went over 4,000. We had a couple that went over 3,000. And it's just one of these deals where, um, you know, live, we've got our, we've got our regulars and we appreciate the live folks who watch it because they make this show go. Uh, but then there's a lot of folks who can't watch live. And so they wind up watching the replay today, later on tonight, tomorrow. And well into the next several weeks. And this, and it doesn't even count. We'd load up all of these onto YouTube, Steve. And I don't know if you know this or not, but I've been making chapter markers. And so when folks ask, when folks see that we talk about something and I load it up onto YouTube, all they have to do is click in the, in the description section, click the question that they want to hear. 
click the time marker and it takes them right there. And so we've had probably a couple thousand views oh. on the replays on YouTube as well. I don't think there's anybody else out there doing this. We're happy to do it. We're glad to do it. And, uh, yes. and we'll keep doing it as long as you guys keep showing up. If you guys aren't here, there's no show. So. Yep. You betcha. Awesome. You betcha. And, and look on, on these DVDs and stuff that I have, Dave has set it up. So some of these things are digital. You yeah. just push a button. I don't know how it works and it goes directly to your computer. So, you know, I'm trying to do anything I can, folks, to help you out. You know, I travel throughout the United States, throughout the world. That person from Croatia, I think that's, uh, that's one of, that's, that's a first for me. Yeah. Uh, in Croatia. Uh, that's great. I get emails from all over the world. I, I, uh, just sent a saddle to Costa Rica. Uh, I've had some folks from, uh, Great Britain contact me. From the, uh, the Great Britain Mule Society. I may be going over to Great Britain to, to help them train some mules. So, uh, it's fun. It's, 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 it's awesome. Uh, hey, uh, one last thing. Yeah. Minnesota horse shows coming up. Yep. Minnesota. Notice they always say horse folks. Listen, I need you to email these, all these expos and say equine or say horse. Mule, donkey. That's right. Let's get them mules and, and donkeys in there. Okay. That's right. We've got several p folks who I know are going to meet you there. Um, hey, real quick, uh, for one of our viewers, JC Greg Eden, is it Jackie Greg or is it JC Greg? I want to pronounce it correctly. Uh, let's see. Judy says, uh, Steve, we'll see you at the horse expo in Minnesota. Uh, Yolanda says, Ooh, my hats, uh, hats. My mule loves them. Uh, JC Greg says, love the hat. Rose Stewart says, nice hat. Um, Eileen Easterdes says, thanks for the time. She says, ooh, nice knife as well. Lydia says, I like your hat. I love the knife too. Mickey says, you are both awesome. Thank you, Mickey. And then uh, let's see. Yolanda says, I just send my email to Steve about choice of hat. I love the buckaroo the most. Jana Smith says, please continue. Uh, Jackie, thank you. Jackie uh, Eden says, I will see you in Minnesota. Lydia says, this is my first time joining in on this live session. Love all the information. We'll keep watching and checking out the others on YouTube. Carla says, love your hat and knife. That is how we will end things. Steve, thanks so much. Appreciate it. And we will see everybody. Uh, we'll find out a time for next week because you're going to be traveling. We will find the right time and we'll let everyone know. Sound good? Absolutely. Sounds good, partner. All right. God bless. See you all. God bless. Bye-bye.